Um, this is the future of mobile esports, so I'd very much like to welcome to the stage, please, uh, Spike Laurie from ESL, David Lee from ESP, uh, Craig Churchill from Skills, and Ben Watley from Super Evil Megacore. Come on up. I'm going to take this chair here at the end, so if you've got it. Oh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Have you guys uh, all got mics? I believe so. I'm going to ask. I'm gonna ask yes, no, I'll yes. sit. I've got, I think I've got a chair here at the end. That's it. Yeah, thank you. We're all good. Great, great. Thanks, guys. So, um, we're, we're going to be talking today about the, um, uh, the future of, uh, of, of mobile esports. Um, we've heard a lot this afternoon about, um, uh, about what a phenomenon esports is and how big the market is. Um, and we're going to be casting our mind forward a little bit here and seeing what, uh, what's going on with the market and, and where we're going. But before I do, I gave um, uh, the briefest introduction there before we came on. What I'd like to do is just run down the line there, and, and David, we'll start with you perhaps. Perhaps you could just say a couple of words about uh, the business you're in, what part you play in the ecosystem. <clears throat> so uh, we're at ESP. Uh, we basically uh, create tournaments around video games, put them on TV or on stream, um, and uh, we have several uh, several other business lines. Um, we're going to be uh, we have an investment arm as well, uh, investing in different agencies uh, in the industry, in the esports industry, um, as well as a, a betting platform. Great, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, so uh, Skills is the, the sort of world's leading enabling platform for mobile esports. Um, we provide, how can I put this, a competition as a service multiplayer uh, engine that can transform any mobile game into an esport. And that's without the, the hassle and overhead of running live operations. We do all of that. We do all of the anti-fraud, anti-cheating, and uh, all of the, uh, as I said, live operations. We, we power in, in excess of about a million competitions a day. Wow. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Spike. I'm the um, VP of Publisher Relations at ESL. Um, we're the world's leading global esports company. We've been around for about 20 years. Uh, if you see those big stadium pictures of Intel Extreme Masters or um, ESL One, um, that's some of the cool stuff we do around the world, among um, other things. Uh, hi, I'm Ben Wadley. I'm the head of esports for Super Evil Megacorp. Uh, we currently have a single IP known as Vainglory, for anyone that's uh, played that, and uh, had a kind of the first foray into mobile esports globally a number of years ago, and kind of helped set the pace that uh, a mobile esport can actually be a thing. Amazing, thank you. So. Um before we talk about what, what the future holds and where things are going, let's maybe try and uh, talk a little bit about what the landscape looks like now. Um, we saw, um, uh, you know, we, people who've been here this afternoon saw on screen uh, those fantastic arenas and people playing games. We speak a lot. Of, we've spoken a lot about um, about phenomena like PUBG and things. Um, what has mobile though brought to esports? What, what is mobile doing for esports right now? Um, uh, yeah, Ben, do you want to maybe take us away there and, and talk about that? Yeah, sure. So. Uh, Ultimately, I think esports as a category it just needs to be defined as the ability to compete in a game, right? So whether you're competing on a mobile phone or a PC or a console, the idea is that skilled players that have just skills beyond most of our capabilities are able to showcase these in some version of competition. Uh, and at, at Super Evil, one of the visions that uh, our founders had about five or six years ago wasn't necessarily about esports. It was just bringing a core game experience experience to mobile, that you could still, you could experience what you would expect on a PC or console on a mobile device. It just so happens that our community, uh, after the launch, were, were asking for competition and, and looking for ways to showcase themselves, uh, and, and, and it, it created an eSport. Uh, Vainglory didn't set out to do that, it just became one. And I think that was pretty important for us to understand that, yes, mobile gaming can be core, it can have depth, it can have... Uh, strategic ambition, just like any other platform, but ultimately uh, the players really drove the feeling behind the fact that they wanted to be competitive. They wanted to showcase that it, just because it's a mobile device doesn't mean that they will not have the same capabilities. And I think it's all about the accessibility. The fact that billions of players can participate in this and they don't need to uh, have a console or PC, they just use the device in their pocket, is, is kind of wild. Like, I can be a pro gamer on my phone that that's insane. I, th I think um, Ben raises some really good points there that um, esports, the very essence of competitive play, is 
aspirational. You know, people see the the guys, the CS players or the Dota players, and and aspire to 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 do that. And what the mobile phone allows you to do is it gives that to people that can't afford the barrier to entry. I think there's a I think there are socioeconomic reasons as to why mobile is su is such a popular medium. When we see Southeast Southeast Asia, Asia, Latin America, those countries really booming with mobile esports, because if you only have a thousand dollars to spend, it's likely you're going to spend it on a an iPhone or a um, a Razer phone if uh, Michael's around still. <laughs> uh, yeah, before you're going to then spend that on a on a on a Nvidia 1080. Um, card, right? And I think the the games are a response to that desire, um, and it's self-fulfilling, that the more that that is, is stoked by companies like Super Evil or Tencent or Supercell, the more then that creates a demand for it as well, and it sort of self-fulfills. Yeah, yeah, great. In fact, you, you guys both have raised some really interesting points that I, I want to kind of come back to later, but but um, but Craig, let's talk there, because a lot of the games that are in um, the skills uh, champions at the moment are much more casual than perhaps playing or other things there. So what? Yeah. So what? What do you bring to the the uh, esports arena with that in mind? So, so just picking up on a couple of points that these gentlemen were talking about. I think playing games is as natural as breathing, right? I mean, it's a it's an endemic part of who we are as a species. Um, it, you know, it's 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 part of how we socialize. Mm. Uh, it's part of how we uh, compare against one another, and it's it's you know it's a, it's a very strong neuroscientific cocktail being generated in the brain when we play games, right? I mean, that's that's just a fact. So we're we're sort of um, uh, predispos predisposed to, to play games. Mobile just drives accessibility more than anything. I think you know that's one thing that uh, skills. When we started off a company about six years ago, we really wanted to target the mobile platform as opposed to the PC platform, just due to sheer size and opportunity. And I think over that over that period of time, what we've seen is a really interesting phenomenon occur in the traditional esports world. I think a lot of players regard themselves as either professional athletes or they're certainly in the in the top echelons and the you know these these gentlemen you know play play in that arena the traditional skills player is much more the, the casual kind of player and they don't self identify as a professional athlete by any stretch of the imagination they're more inclined to play bubble shooters or match threes um, but they they do it for the thrill of the competition still yeah. so we have a huge kind of um, underbelly of amateur games Gamers and casual gamers that I think is essential for the growth of esports, mobile esports in general. You need that underbelly in order to have the top echelon as well. Yeah, right. We were, we were talking in, a, in an earlier uh, discussion about that kind of pyramid of, of, of you know, of, of activity, whether that's esports or genuine sport, you know, sort of, you know, athletic sports, whether it's the kind of grassroots all the way up to the professional gamer. Um, David, of course, you're, um, uh, you work with that kind of pro, pro gamer activity. I mean, how, how do you feel mobile plugs into the current landscape? Of, uh, yeah, the beauty of mobile gaming and uh, you know, for for us at ESP, we've produced more mobile game uh, esports competition type uh, competitions um, on broadcast. Um, like, I think I think overall, like if we look at it, uh, just casual to to pro. Um, Casual titles, you could always have competition too, right? Esports, like like you said, in the, in the pyramid of um, grassroots to semi amateur to like semi pro to to pro to like the legendary status where you know you're competing on stage in front of thousands of people. Um, as long as there is competition, it's esports, right? And we should, we just kind of lump in anything that uh, we could create a league around. So if you look at um, you know like for example the Amazon Champions of Fire, where you had games like Pac. Man and Disney's Crossy Roads, that those are high score games that were created into an esports type of format where people were competing. Yeah. So I think from that to something like Vainglory, where you have professional teams uh, like organizations like TSM involved, um, I think you know the the entire landscape is you know uh, very very broad and um, can be defined in many different ways. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, actually, just sticking with that for for a moment there, because it was interesting something you said earlier, Ben, about how you didn't design Vainglory necessarily to be an esport that was competitive, but that and it kind of organically became one. Is it possible? Or advisable, maybe is a better way. Is it advisable to design a game specifically to be an esport, or do you have to just create a competitive game and hope that people play it? What's the what's the deal there? How, how do you how would you approach somebody who, who was working on a game right now and advise them to get into it? I, I think I think the proper way to do it is to create a good game and support 
and make when you create the game, have support for esports available, right? So there are many things like in the core infrastructure of a game, such as custom game lobbies where you and I could add each other on a friends list and play each other that many, many developers uh, don't pay attention to and completely neglect. Same thing with spectating modes, right? So if you ever want to create a tournament and have broadcasting abilities, you have to have the ability to have somebody watch that game and right. capture that game, right? So um, from a perspective that you know the the broader audience can understand rather than just seeing just somebody's first person uh, view. Yeah. So I think they're uh, having that kind of support and having that attention and keeping that in mind so that when the game does grow and have and, and is able to support that type of viewership, um, you can dev out those needs. Yeah. Yeah. I, I rarely find myself agreeing with David Lee, but on this occasion <laughs> he's spot on. Uh, you need to build good tool set, uh, a, a well balanced game, and then be in it for the long haul, right? Understand that um, that you need to be there to support it in the long haul, yeah. and um, it's not going to be a case of uh, a flash in the pan success. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, just something to add on to that. In the casual space, there's typically about 20% of the audience that are up for a competition, up for thrill of the competition, and consequently, you've really got to take that main skew casual game and convert it to a competitive mode game. That means it's got to be a shorter play session. Yep. Uh, you've got to have you know, uh, tournament, uh, tournament brackets and, and leaderboards and all that good stuff. So uh, there is absolute an absolute requirement to convert a game over, over to uh, a tournament edition. So um, in answer to your question, absolutely. I mean, I, I think it's, uh, it's essential in order to make it uh, uh, highly viewable yeah. and, um, and uh, yeah, just very interesting to the players. Yeah, yeah. But something I would add is, as well is it depends on as a developer, what are you envisioning when you tell yourself you're going to create a game that can be an eSport? Like if you want a massive sold out stadium and you're developing a game to get there, that I think it, it's like trying to play basketball and telling yourself as a kid, I'm just going to be the next LeBron, right? Like, can you get there? Maybe, but the chances of it happening are super slim. So what do you do to get there? You work and you practice day in and day out on what the potential might be. And as a developer, I don't actually think it's any different. You create something great and you continue to iterate. You continue to uh, further the progression of whatever your title is. And if it ends up in that scenario, mm -hmm. then you've done something truly wonderful. But if you set out before development, envisioning the scenario, and trying to achieve it, you're going to end up missing a lot of those organic beats along the way that, yeah. that really creates the momentum that your community tells you, like, we want to be on stage, we want to be in front of crowds, and that's just something that has to be earned. You cannot, I don't think you can just build it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. In fact, we were, the thing we were talking about at the end there about the, the, the game as a spectacle, that, that thing that elevates it from being a game to a sport is spectators. That's the, the that's the thing that makes a difference. I saw uh, something on um, one of those news reports that 63% uh, of uh, Asian viewers watching Vainglory games don't play the game themselves. Does that surprise you, that, that number? And what, is, what does that tell you about, the, about how enjoyable it is to watch rather than play? Well, so this is always a very interesting point. When it, it's, so specifically, Vainglory is a MOBA. And MOBAs are not the easiest thing to find yourself stumbling upon and understanding, right? So when we look at a lot of the success of recent first-person shooters and the BR, like you kind of understand, I'm at this side of the gun, that guy's on that side, and if I kill him, that's a good thing, right? Okay. But MOBAs are super complex. So one of the reasons why you see uh, Southeast Asia, China, and a lot of APAC uh, audiences viewing is because they they really do kind of root and appreciate some of the deeper strategy in the MOBA sphere, if you will. Right. Um, it, it hasn't caught on as heavily in the West and in terms of just what the audience in the US, what the audience even in, in Europe kind of want out of a quick paced game. So it, it's only surprising to the extent that anyone would tune into an eSport that doesn't actually play the title. More surprising in the MOBA sense, but I think ultimately the goal is if you're going to create a game and people want to tune in, why are they watching it? Is it because they like the gameplay? Is it because they think the storylines are important? Is it Can they connect with the person uh, that's actually playing? And we're still in the early days of all of this for, for mobile and mobile esports in general. So, uh, But we know that the, the APAC audience is the dominant mobile MOBA audience. So um, not, not too surprising, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so Spike, from, a, um, from a, the perspective of ESL, creating a, a spectacle
vehicle out of a game to turn it into a sport. What's the biggest challenge there? What's, how, how, do you, how do you do that? <laughs> um, that's a really good question. So I, I, I think the biggest challenge that we have um, when talking to publishers and when talking to, to brands is everybody wants that that cherry on the on the top of the cake. That everyone wants a pro league, or everyone wants to sort of to be in a stadium, or everyone wants to do a, a world final. And the advice that we continually give is don't start with that. Think about the cake holistically as a whole. Um, I'm sure there are some people in the room that I've told that to as well. Um, but you need to build every single foundation because if there isn't that aspirational zero to hero story, to to use a buzzword, I apologise. Um, but if there is isn't that, no matter what you build at the top, will never be sustainable. And so we'll always say, start at the bottom, start with the non-sexy stuff, start with the with the, 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 the grassroots, the weekly cups, the amateur stuff, and then build up the layers from there. Have a vision of wh where you want to go and what that cake is going to look like in the future, but don't start at the top, because it's the, it's the surefire way to... Um, to have the rug pulled out from underneath you. Right, right, right. Uh, David, would you concur with that? Is that? Sure, I think I think that's pretty accurate, um, and that that goes across you know all competition, right? Like you're never going to have you know the Super Bowl without you know the first the little leagues, and then you know you know the amateur level, the collegiate level, and then the you know. Uh, I think, yeah, so I think that's really, really accurate. Yeah. So mo mobile games, um, they differ from their uh, traditional esports counterparts in the gameplay, for instance, is often much shorter. Um, you know, they, the, the, um, that's, that's, perhaps that's the demands of the, um, uh, of the device. Also, uh, games that are, that are big in that scene, like let's say Clash Royale, for instance, is, uh, is very much of it is the meta game, which is not such a spectacle. Uh, does that affect how much mobile can grow as an eSport, do you think, uh, mobile games? It's not true of all the games, but I just mean mobile games can be more like that than, than other games. Does the t what I'm trying to say is, does the, the kind of format of, of the most popular mobile games limit their, their growth as an eSports spectacle? C can I just take yeah, a snap yeah. of the meta answer to that? Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's not, it's not addressing your answer specifically. I think uh, Ben may be able to do that. I, I think mobile eSports as an opportunity, it's almost as if we're in a very privileged position to be witnessing the birth of a star to a great okay. degree. I don't, I don't want to kind of overplay my hand on that, but it really does feel like that. I think you've got not only the tech stack to make everything happen, you've got an industry which is full of innovation and full of incredible creative people. Um, you've got a burgeoning economy that's being established that's really trying to break free of the vestiges of old kind of sports models, which is, I think, fascinating. And I think if we, if we really do some transformative innovation on the business side of things, we can see something truly spectacular. And I think, I think ultimately it comes down to that, coupled with, going back to one of your previous questions, you know, the development of heroes and heroines in this space. We, you know, in chess there was Bobby Fischer. Bobby Fischer disappeared. There was the search for the next Bobby Fischer. Right? The, the, we haven't got that yet, but we will get that soon. And as soon as these heroes and heroines start to emerge, with the accessibility of mobile as a platform, I think mobile esports will be the dominant platform, Barnum. Okay. Wow. Well, yeah. Um, I think in terms of game game length and spectatorship, uh, there is no one size fit fit all solution for viewership, right? So every single broadcast, every single format has to be fine tuned and tweaked um, to fit the game title. So, for example, Clash Royale, having a six hour Clash Royale, uh, you know. Competitive, uh, repetitive, same meta type of broadcast is tiring on the viewers. Um, it's much harder to retain viewership, and you're just, you know, heavily relying on that uh, massive, you know, uh, massive DAU or MAU numbers to kind of, you know, grab those viewership numbers from. Um, so I think it's, I think if you have, you know, a 20 second to, you know, a three minute you know, round type of game, uh, it's best to, keep, to kind of tailor your tournament formats or tailor your broadcast formats based uh, on that accordingly. 
look, it's a double-edged sword. The, the reason why mobile games are so popular is because they're quicker and they're shallower than than a, a PC title, for example. Yeah. It's um, I'm sure you can guess why, but um, my bowel movements are now perfectly sunk to the amount of time <laughs> it takes to get 10 crowns in um, <laughs> Clash Royale. Yeah. And yeah. that's as much as I log in, right? Um, the <laughs> uh, That's great. It means I engage with the game every day. Yeah. But the flip side to that is it lacks the depth then to really build out analysis segments, build out sort of extra VT content, build out the kind of the competitive ecosystem that has that overarching meta. Now, I think there's a balance there, and we're going to see many more games, right, I think, that kind of get that balance right. Um, but yeah, totally, you can't have your cake and eat it. I, I love my cake analogies, sorry. <laughs> uh, but you can't have it and eat it, right? Either it's a short, competitive, engaging um, game, yeah. or it's a deep, um, spectator-focused um meaty esport. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Um, uh, absolutely. Uh, let's talk a little bit about then the, the future of mobile esports because that's the topic of the panel and something that, uh, uh, that, that Ben, you, you, um, you brought into it, which is talking a little bit about the um, about APAC and the Asian and the East versus, uh, versus West. Um, of the, uh, I, I saw a stat that that, um, uh, that half of the, the uh, well over half of the uh, of mobile uh, esports uh, viewership is in is in the east. So what do we need to do to uh, to grow mobile esports in the west? Uh, what, what 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 do we need to do to make that big over here? Um, no, David, do you want to take that one? And yeah, um, I, I think it's the development of, of more core titles and more esports friendly titles, um, and. I think the West is a little slower to accept mobile esports, uh, mobile as a platform for, you know, high-end esports and competitive gaming. Mm -hmm. um, you know, ha hashtag you know PC Master Race is you know a very very popular thing on the internet. Um, so I think out east, um, people have already accepted that they, you know, they fully acknowledge it. They could get the full core gaming experience, and it's a lot of fun, and you could have the highest levels of competition, and they accept it. I think it's a matter of, you know, just just like when PC gaming first took off um, and people, you had the naysayers there um, and, and the West was, you know, the slowest to adapt again, yeah? you know, when the PC blew up, the West was slowest to adapt to say, okay, this is like a valid sport. Um, we could actually have real competition. Uh, I think we're going to eventually get there. It's just a matter of time. Right, right. Oh, so are you going to leap in next? I was, you know, was going to say it's, it's, for me, it's more of a matter of like when, not if, because it, it's just natural organic uh, growth. I mean, whether, if it's a mobile game or a PC game, if someone's just watching it, you can remove the nameplates, remove commentators, if people are just looking at it, it obviously, like, it, it's getting to the point where the mobile engines and the ability uh, for them to create things, they don't look like mobile games anymore, to where people just wouldn't know unless you told them this is a mobile game. And I think ultimately, be, one of the reasons why it's accepted so widely in the East is because it's not just the developers and publishers that are doing a great job with it, it's, it's everyone. It's the, the government, it's the media, it's all of the marketing channels. And in the US, like if you read a lot of media publications that still kind of downplay mobile gaming, you still get these questions like, is mobile gaming the next big thing? Can mobile gaming be esports? Like, the answer to that is it's already a big thing and it's already massive on scale of esports beyond PC gaming, specifically in countries like China. Like Indonesia is a massive uh, mobile uh, esport country as well. So it's, we have to kind of realize in order for it to grow in the West, we just have to create the best games. Yeah. These guys have to put on the best spectacles and displays. And then like for integration partners like Skills, we just have to give as many opportunities for players to compete as possible at whatever scale that they feel comfortable at. Then once we've done that, we've set the framework. It's about working with marketing, publishers, and media, and, and kind of shifting the mindset as mobile first gamers grow up that this is a cool thing to do. This is acceptable. Because ultimately, society pressure does have an impact. Yeah. And I think we'll, we'll get over it. But we're just in the kind of awkward teenage years right now in terms of acceptance. So can I just quickly say that I think we also need to put it in perspective that the grass is always greener. I mm -hmm. think the Eastern market wants the monetization of the West, and the Western market wants the player base of the East. Right. And I think um, you need both for, you know, and, and games like League of Legends, for example, thrive because they have the monetization of the West um, and the and the mass users of, of the East. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just, just a final point from me, I think, um, you know, the, the East had the first mover advantage, I think, in many respects, but connectivity and 5G, that's going to drive a 
huge amount of growth, a huge amount of creativity, I mean, ubiquitous gaming. So, I, you know, I think, I think the stakes will change, and I think we'll see a massive upswell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, some of the games we've been talking about today, um, during the course of the afternoon, uh, PUBG and Fortnite, for instance, are games that exist on PC and uh, mobile and so on. And, and, and you spoke there the, uh, you know, the, about the differences between PC and, um, uh, and mobile. Does the future have, is the future cross-platform? As a discussion point, it, it, what do you think about cross-platform gaming, and is that is that a way that you, you, you look? Against? I, I I don't think the future is cross-platform, um, only because there are certain inherent advantages that each you know platform platform has. If you look historically, like um, for example, Call of Duty, when they had uh, you know Xbox, PS PS3, and PC and PC, um, they immediately had to take it down because uh, PC was just. just absolutely demolishing everybody, right? Because, you know, the precision clicking with a mouse and keyboard, um, you cannot compare that to joysticks, right? Um, a D-pad or on mobile, right? So I think even on Fortnite, uh, you see huge, like you actually have competitive, uh, competitive advantages on the mobile platform because people already know you can't be as good on the mobile, right? Like you can see where somebody's shooting you from, whereas if you're playing on PC, you don't have that advantage, right? So um, I don't think the future is cross-platform. I think mobile's gonna overtake everything eventually. All right. And Fortnite players specifically are playing with a mouse and keyboard adapter on console to be competitive or using peripherals or emulators with PCs on, on mobile because they know there's an advantage. Yeah, I, th I think so I semi agree with David on the answer. I, I, it's we're living in the present, and the future is always it. it asking what is the future of anything is is always a, a bit philosophical. But games that are made today are not being developed to be cross platform. If ultimately the accessibility, uh, which is why I said I semi agree. Like if the future is mobile gaming, because it just means that developers and publishers make more money, yeah. then that might just end up being the future. The games might be developed to be mobile, but also playable on console and also playable on PC. And I think that's just an industry that uh, will develop alongside from a financial standpoint. Because like people don't, like developers making a game that pushes the newest graphics card in your PC, it, it, it's cool, but that's not mass market and that's not going to be the best monetization strategy. So I, I think the dollar will lead the industry in some case, but when we talk about billions of players, I mean that, that is the future, and if you can access that massive crowd, however you make your game and what it's compatible with, will be lenient towards how can I get this in front of as many people as possible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I kind of fall in that camp as well. Um, I think revenue does lead the equation, uh, and whenever asked, you know, can technology solve this problem? Is there a world in which you get cross-platform gameplay? The answer always has to be yes. Yeah. Technology will solve it at some point, but but I do take these gentlemen points on board. I think today it's a struggle. Yeah. Tomorrow, maybe not. So we'll be into the kind of the last uh, 10 minutes before questions of this. I, I, I'll, I'll ask the kind of show me the money kind of question. Um, there's a, a, a esports and well, mobile itself is a, a very lucrative business. Um, esports itself is, uh, it makes a lot of money. I should say, uh, uh, um, Craig, you very humbly haven't mentioned the fact that I, I recall, wasn't your company named the fastest growing company in America last year? Something like that by Inc. Magazine? By Inc. Magazine, yeah. yeah. Fastest growing yeah, company yeah. in America. Uh, meanwhile, we see um, uh, that New Zoo are reporting that um, you know, the, the esports revenues are huge. Potentially um, 1.5 billion by 2020 was one figure that was thrown around, uh, and of which mobile is not the entire market, but is a good 40 to 50 percent, right? That's 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 loads. So, what what are the all the ways that we monetize esports at the moment? Will it be the same methods going forward? And can the market keep on growing? Is there you know what, what's what's the limit with the money? Is it is it going to be a lucrative business in the future? I hope so. <laughs> sure. We, we hope so, because that's our business, right? He wants to be paid in cake, yeah, yeah, cake yeah. by the way. <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah, so, so this answer, I think, is quite complicated, because monetizing esports, if we're not even talking about mobile, if we're just talking about the category in general, is, uh, is, not, is not necessarily easy. Because the infrastructure for how you would monetize traditional sports in terms of broadcasting rights and a lot of channel affinity, like we're still growing all of the infrastructures that support 
being able to view an eSport and the partnerships and sponsors you would seek to partner with it and where do they make their money and is yep. it through like in because is it a call to action from direct apparel is it the publisher like league or whoever that makes an in-game item that can be associated with a sponsor on the broadcast like the complexities to how you reach monetization through eSports is not very straightforward and a lot of developers use eSports as, as a loss kind of leader major marketing strategy where you are bringing players to the title where they're monetizing within the app more than you are actually monetizing directly from the streams or from the yep. broadcast. Yep. Now, I do think uh, ultimately for esports to truly succeed, that will be uh, eventually where we end up, where you're able to actually throw an event and the event uh, perhaps brings in more money than it costs to throw. I mean, like, it's kind of a wild thing to think about that if it's purely related to the experience of the esport itself and not directly directly tied to how you monetize in the game from mm. people that might be viewing at home or attending in the stands. But uh, but mobile will fit into that category because as an industry, I think it will basically be similar solutions regardless of what platform you're playing on. So, so I'll, I'll give you a peek under the hood of skills uh, in terms of the statistics and, and sort of innovation around the revenue model and the business model. So again, our players don't self-identify as professional gamers per se, but the number one player on our platform last year, they grossed about $420,000 in casual gameplay. <laughs> right? They're playing, now admittedly this person was playing you know, 10 hours a day, every single day, but an average player on the skills platform plays for about 63 minutes, they, do, they play about 14 games every day, and they're making money on bubble shooting games. And we, we operate a revenue share model where the player makes money, it's a player funded competition, the developer or publisher makes money, and skills makes money in a revenue share environment. Mm -hmm. So uh, just as, uh, as another uh, fun statistic, so we grew our business, we doubled our business in the past nine months to a $200 million run rate. So I mean, that says that there's a model there, yeah, yeah. right? And also that player that made $420,000 last year, they were playing uh, what we call strike bowling, a finger touch bowling game. Had they been on the PBA circuit, the physical circuit, they would have been the second highest paid bowler on the circuit. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, on, the, on the event side of things, I mean, is a, a hosting events is, a, is also a costly thing to do. It's a, you know, there's, there's risk associated. But, but do you, you know, the, I, I guess, the, uh, do you want to sort of wade in there on on, or, on how lucrative the future is uh, without perhaps giving too many secret, trade secrets away? But it's uh, it's still a, you know, it's it's there's still many streams to make money from from events, right? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I think um, the biggest place we've seen sort of. Uh, an upside in monetization is through sponsors and brand partnerships. Um, we were very lucky as ESL, we struck a deal with Gillette last year, and this year it was Mercedes-Benz. Yeah. So bringing in sort of large, non-endemic sponsors who are very risk-averse, slow-moving, it's taken a long time to educate these brands to bring them into the space. Um, and obviously I think there's a great opportunity for those brands to connect with the millennial audience in a way that they haven't wanted to before, or they haven't understood before. So yeah. I think that's uh, one way that we're seeing sort of revenue come in and offset the costs. As Ben rightly says, I think the, the publishers um, have in the past used esports as a marketing tool. Rightly or wrongly so. Esports is an engagement tool. It's a retention and engagement tool of your fan base. It is not an acquisition tool um, and it is not a monetization tool. It's an engagement tool. And if you understand that and use it correctly, then there is obviously a lot to win as a publisher by engaging in esports platforms. So I think what, we, what we're seeing now is publishers are becoming much more savvy. Mm -hmm. Look at Activision, right? Great example. Someone that in the past has used games as an engagement, as a marketing tool, and now they need to be profitable, right? They have said, you know, Bobby Kotick has said, right, I'm going to put my bet on Overwatch. We're going to go out. We're going to make some big money, and we're going to we're going to make this a revenue driver rather than it's it's an engagement tool as well. Yeah. But they're primarily looking as, as a revenue driver, and I think getting that balance right as the publisher is super important. And as a company like ESL, our job is to help get that balance right and to make that happen to offset some of the risk and to, to let games thrive, supported by um, the publisher and supported by big brands. Right, right, right. David, you? I, I think, um, yeah, I think I agree with everything that's been said so far. Uh, in terms of like trends for monetization, uh, I think Dota really started with the compendium. Um, and, you know, to your point, they 
funded more than the actual event itself costs um, just by raising um, all the DLC uh, sales, right? Um, and I think with Dota Success, you saw League of Legends do the same thing. You saw um, you saw Hearthstone start doing it, and you saw I mean obviously CS:GO monetizes very well off events, right? So I think um, using esports as a loss leader, um, I think that's going to be a very antiquated model. Um, I think everybody has to start looking towards monetizing their esports platform because why are you sp spending millions of dollars marketing on esports without giving your chance to, giving your chance to monetize? And I think um, you know one of the events that we did last year um, at Microsoft Theater for Summoners War was the first ever World Championship for Summoners War, right? And um, what what uh, come to us did very well was they created all these in-game items leading up to the event. You show up to the event, we had people fly in from all around the world to attend the event just to get in-game awards, nice. right? And um, they had you know free items, they had paid items, and it actually became a very strong revenue driver. They saw a huge peak, right? And I think in PGC London, there was a presentation about that. So uh, you see mobile already taking from the learnings from the, the decades of you know PC esports, you know, monetization models, and then applying it to um, to mobile esports as well, to esports uh, marketing platforms. Nice, nice. Well, look, we're we're within the uh, the, the final uh, few minutes here. If I, can I um, take any questions from the uh, from the audience? Perhaps does anyone have any questions on the future of esports? Yes, please. David, you specifically mentioned how Clash Royale has harder user retention in terms of tournaments because of the three-minute games. What, how would you structure that tournament differently so that there are more consistent concurrence? Um, I just think, like, so I was at, I was actually at ESL um, producing the the European and the South American uh, Crown Championship last year. Um, and one of the things that I saw was, it's a very fun, high quality broadcast. You saw the same meta over and over and over again until you saw a patch update. Or you saw somebody do something crazy and then everybody has to adapt. So I think um, limiting, you know, the. I think limiting the, 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 the broadcast format, the broadcast times, so it's not so, uh, I guess, tedious for the viewers is the way to do it. Um, whether it means shortening it and adding more you know, VT content, um, like from content creators such as yourself, right? Um, or whether it means that you, know, you go from a BO5 to a BO3 or something like that. Um, you could only watch so much, right? So one of the things like, for example, like our, uh, for the Champions of Fire event where we had Pac-Man, right? In 2016, what we did was we had this bracketed play where everybody was playing Pac-Man for like 40 minutes. Nobody wants to watch Pac-Man for 40 minutes. It's, it's like a 30-second game, right? So what we did was we did like a you know World's Strongest Man competition with leaderboards where we're just rotating game titles. So you see people competing, you know, in two-minute, three-minute intervals. So it's really fun to watch like different players compete in different games. It's constantly changing. The pacing is great. So I think adjusting the broadcast and, a, and adjusting the pacing, um, depending on the game titles. If it's a short game title, you don't want to watch. A six-hour broadcast of Clash Royale is insane, right? So um, I think that people have to start, you know, ad adjusting to um, game lengths for their uh, alongside the, the the broadcast lengths. Um, that was a question was aimed at David, but do any of you guys want to leap in leap in on that, or should we take another question? Another question. Yeah, let's do it. Anyone? Another question. We've got a, just got a couple of minutes left, so yeah, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Please do. In red, yeah. So on casual now, there's more female players than male. Um, what is the current demographic of esports, and how do you see it uh, develop going forward? That's a great question. I don't know whether you heard that, but about the demographic, uh, male, female. Uh, depends on the on the medium. I think we're seeing sort of um, uh, PC, and it also depends on the on the region as well. So I think it's as high as something like um, ninety percent male uh, on on sort of hardcore PC games, um, and then um, as you move into the mobile space, it becomes more sort of even. I think it's about sixty percent, forty percent, something like that. But really depends on the title, depends on the region, and depends on um, the, the medium as well, where it's being played on, PC versus console versus mobile. I think down in the in the kind of lower amateur ranks where kind of skills operates for the more casual titles, our top 10 players who grossed about three and a half million dollars last year, 70% were female. Wow, that's interesting. And what, do you happen to know what to hand what the demographics of the vainglory? Um, 
Uh, Vainglory is, is predominantly uh, male demographics, as may be expected. Specifically, obviously, in esports, um, there was like one uh, notable female in China that uh, played the game and had quite the following and created quite the aspiration. But it, it's a little bit of a balance and, and maybe a faux pas at this point to talk about. Like, there, the complications for perhaps why it's in the top level of esports, uh, out of casual, uh, to see lots of males uh, versus females, it could likely change just over the course of time. Because up to this point, gaming is still, especially competitive gaming, uh, ha has been, it, it's pushed so much more heavily onto young males when we were growing up, at least. Um, and I think mobile gaming has a very interesting uh, opportunity to impact a larger portion of the female population because it is still, mobile esports are still so new and the accessibility factor is still so there. We have an, a, a better opportunity to educate the fact that uh, it just doesn't have to just be a male thing. It's not just about guys huddled around their Xbox playing Halo back in 2001. Um, so I think it, it just depends. But like I said, it depends on what you mean by esport as well. If it's a uh, kind of the, like a casino game in the US, then most of your top apps are going to be female players competing on and perhaps you know between the different things that they're doing in their life kind of on the go because they're very busy and they're always kind of especially if you're uh, uh, if you have like children at home there, there's there's so many society variables that surround the true like definition of how to get maybe more females into esports um, but the thing that I do like a lot about esports is uh, at least from our perspective is there's the barrier to entry uh, it, it's not physical it, it's not something that you would normally say like, oh, uh, only a man can can to kind of do this thing. Esports has an opportunity to really level that playing field, and the responsibility is on us just to make sure we're uh, touting those storylines equally amongst all all players. And on the mobile platform, you see the highest number of female uh, gamers, yeah. right? So more than console, more than PC. So I think uh, you know you'll see a lot more females and a lot more uh, gender equality. Great, thank you very much. Well, look, we're out of time, folks, so I just very much, very quickly like to, to thank our fantastic panelists, whiz by. Uh, so, uh, uh, Ben from Super uh, Evil Megacore, uh, Spike from ESL, uh, Craig from Skills, and David from ESP. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Thank you.